some more kind of yeah, we're kind of hoping some more people would turn up, then we'll get into chapter three. But here we are. Yeah, cool. I know it might be a small Thursday crowd. People might have well migrated to top Tuesday. Yeah, like, whatever. Fair enough. It'll just be Tuesday was not super big either. Well, we'll see. I mean it's a little bigger. I actually look forward to it because I'm gonna learn a ton of history from my from Trevor. So I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, and the the thing, thing. one thing I wanted to share with you when you were critical last week about you know they're picking on you know france as the item they were going to do the contrast between america i mean i really appreciated that but so i think there are these critiques of what they've done but also what they've been able to like at least they produce this like dialogue between one way of thinking about how societies have to be organized and another way Mm. I, I think know, my, argument, my argument, Bill, was that that argument started in England and its colonies in the, in the Americas in about 1620. And so, yeah, it, so the, is the question, why did they pick this one between the Iroquois nations and the French yeah. colony? Oh. Okay, yeah. Well, so, so that's, that, that, that would be a point. reasonable question. That would be a question yeah, you yeah. could ask when grow, like. You know, I'm, yeah. I mean, you could say that a lot of philosophical issues get settled on battlefields. They don't get settled in in literary salons and essay competitions uh, in France. And in terms of the the battlefields, you're looking at the Amer the English civil wars. You're looking at the decapitation of a king, which is a pretty powerful critique of an absolutist monarch. Like, okay, guys, we've had enough of this guy. We're going to take his head off. <laughs> it's like, whoa, in, in 1649. Now, that's a pretty powerful argument against the kind of thing that was typical in, in most of continental Europe. And, of course, <laughs> in terms of religious beliefs and stuff like that, people, there was tremendous radical stuff going on, uh, diggers and levelers and all this kind of stuff. And many of them jumped ship and went to the USA to founded colonies that were in pursuit of their ideal ideas about what a holy community is like. You know, I mean, Pennsylvania, all of them, the Pilgrim Fathers. So, and it kind of interests me that academics tend to only start this stuff in, in, in the 1770s with, with, with philosophical debates, and then the French Revolution and the American Revolution. You're thinking, hang on, guys, a lot of these things were already settled in England. Way, well, way they weren't, before that. They were they just weren't, doing it. They, I don't think they were settled. They were basically generated as, you know, they were like, uns for me, unsettled. Well, it's not like, really. Like, because like, wait a minute. Can... These people say, like, we're acting like barbarians. <laughs> well, I think they were settled because the point about the English oh. is they, they'd invented the scientific method, Isaac Newton, physics and so on. They had the Royal Society up running in about 1660, the world's first scientific peer group. And they also had the modern state with central banking running by the year 1700. They'd done all that. And they just got operating it and said, well, we're just doing it. We're not going to tell you what we're doing. We're just doing it. So it's a well, different should, cultural should, tradition. Yeah. So some of the history I've been reading, I don't think would, I don't know if it's so settled that just in the way you said it, I think around, I don't know, I'm interested now in some scientific history about what kind of methods were the scientists, you know, in China and India using, because they also were making observations, making sure they had some way to talk about what they saw, yeah, making course. sure they could verify what they measured, you know, so they were also having conversations about like, what are we doing? Yeah, of course. When we're trying it's to do something. Thousands of so, years. Yeah. So I, I think the European, for the history I read recently, the Europeans were successful. We talked about this last time because they just got better at warfare and they defeated lots of other cultures and imposed a lot, right? Were able to just like squash other, <sighs> other, other cultures. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Yeah. But I don't know if I could... 
I'd have to do some work uh, to uh, is, agree with you. Like really the scientific, weird. the scientific method originated with Newton. There might be some, you know, scholars of scientific history of scientific history that might have something else to say about that particular sentence. Just, you know, abstracted that way. Yeah, I mean, the thing about that is that it doesn't mean that there wasn't science and technology for for centuries. I mean, there's a guy called Joseph Needham. This is really not talking about the book, is it? But okay. So there's a guy called Joseph Needham, who's a British guy, who started researching Chinese science and technology yeah, 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 no, yeah, in, no, in, no. in the 1920s. And he went out there yeah. and it was in the middle of total disorder and chaos, collecting manuscripts to bring him back to his, I think it's Cambridge University, the, ne the Needham. And there is the Needham question. And that question is, why didn't what we think of as science and technology get, get off the ground in China in the way that it did in Britain? And it's a very good question. Yeah, I, so I have some, I think I've been reading some alternate, some other critiques of some of that, although Needham did an enormous amount of solid, you know, work that can be relied on for, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, but you're right, but, okay, unfreezing the ice age. Unfreezing the ice age, yeah. So I, I thought it was very good because, I mean, you know, you, where I'm living, I live just down the road from Stonehenge. So that is so oh. close to my heart. And, and when it gets around to Christmas time, I say, well, you know, people were celebrating uh, Christmas at Stonehenge about 7,000 years ago because there's evidence that they were. People were coming from all over Britain to gather to celebrate the, the winter um, solstice as far back as about 5000 BC, which is way before there was any agriculture. They got to building temples and stuff around about 3000 BC, but they were already gathering and doing their thing. So that's yeah, kind I think, of quite, yeah. I think that shows up in this book. They mentioned yeah, a lot of, a lot look of look variety yeah. of, uh, I have a one thing I underlined from page 81 that says when they were talking, perhaps the only thing we can say with real certainty is that in terms of ancestry, we all are Africans because they go through a, yeah, a yeah, bunch absolutely. of stuff about. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what, um, what they're leading up to in the next chapter is a sort of question like, where did it all go wrong? And actually, I'm not at all convinced it did go wrong because vast numbers of human beings in the world get on with lives looking after the people they love and the people they care for in spite of all the craziness around them and they don't really care about the craziness around them they just kind of navigate it in a kind of creative way to look after the people they care about most of them are not thinking about politics or any of this kind of stuff they're just trying to get by and that's what people have always done you know so I think that for example I would argue that us three here are probably more prosperous in real terms than Jeff Bezos or, or Elon Musk or any of these other weird guys. We are getting on with stuff. Uh, we've got the freedom to do that. And we are. I just don't buy the idea that we're kind of oppressed by Elon Musk or, or um, Jeff Bezos' sense, which I don't give, give a damn what those guys do. Why would I? Who cares, you know? No, I I, 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 I I understand your point. Yeah, go, go ahead. I, I, I like that. Um, the I, I think the the point of the chapter for me was how did we end up getting stuck in in one social structure, and not even being able to conceive that there might be other social structures. Whereas through history, you know, it goes back and forth, and even in different cultures, in different you know, at the same time, there's a lot of different cyclical it used to be driven by seasons and seasonal abundance and things like that but there's a lot of <coughs> cyclical change to the political structures um and so we we've ended up kind of whether or not you know i'm richer than jeff bezos is is one thing to think about but another thing is why do we have why have we kept concentrating on that and doubling down and doubling down and doubling down on the the social structure that creates the differences between jeff and i yeah. I don't think all of us do that. I think lots of us just ignore it. I think you're right. Yeah. I, don't, well, we, I'm, 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 I mean, when I was when I was a, a, a sort of 
going through university in the 1969-1973. When I read about history, everything was in, in the UK was supposed to be a complete catastrophe of galloping inflation, uh, bodies not getting buried, rubbish in the streets, strikes, blah, 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 blah. To be honest, I didn't notice any of it. I was just too busy getting on with enjoying the, my company, the company of my friends at university and chilling out and doing, going to parties. And I didn't even notice any of it. <laughs> and I, and yeah, I think, well, you know, it, it's an older person's preoccupation with this stuff, but young people, they just kind of find themselves in a particular context and they find their way how to get on. And they don't analyze it mostly in terms of political structures or any of this kind of stuff or capitalism or few people do. It's a kind of minority hobby. I know, well, I think that's a little severe as hobby, but I think there are, but there are young people who really are trying to understand, you know. Yeah, when they were back then. Why, all, well, why all the black men that get stopped by police end up shot, but shot and the white men end up like in handcuffs? Yeah, sure. It's like, uh, yeah. uh, do, you have, do you have an answer to the question? You know? well, it, well, the point about that is it's a local phenomenon in the USA. It doesn't happen here at all. Other things do right. happen, but that does not happen. Yeah, okay. Because, I, I, and the reason for that is the police in, in, in the UK are not armed. Well, it's an unarmed police force. No, I understand that. All right, so that was a yeah. bad example. Sure. Uh, um, well, the other thing I want to follow from what Pete said, the other thing they say in this book is I have a couple of underlines. They said, you know, on page 86, they're talking about... Uh, how, how we get into you know, dominant submissive kind of behavior patterns. So they make the claim about this person, Christopher Bohm, or Berm. He says that what makes societies distinctively human is our ability to make a conscious decision to act socially in a particular way or not. Yeah. You know, and we do that like in the United States by you know, forming governments, electing people, giving them authority, making laws, finding ways to like, you know, hold people accountable if they break the law. So, yeah, sure. But, and so their argument, I think part of this book is that they would like to have more conversations about more possibilities about the way to organize. Because I know from reading Graeber's other work and some of the anarchist work, it's based on trying to push at maybe our <laughs> assumption that, you know, it really is a, uh, you know, there's really not enough to go around in the world and it's whoever is strong enough to get to the pie gets dinner. Maybe that's not the best, I, you know, maybe that's not the best thing to think that way. Maybe we could think a different way. Well, most people I know don't think that way anyway, never have. And I don't know, six out of 10 of the white men in my community here, I think do think that way. That might be the case, but you do live in Texas. I live in England. Well, that, yeah, well, they're, cult no, I, they're culturally very, very different. People underestimate well, I, the huge difference between the culture of, of the UK and the culture I'm of the USA. To, well, and it's true in other parts of Europe too. I mean, the European. It's also true have, in different parts of the states as well. I mean, the, the, the fifty states are not all the same, of course. It's a big place, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get into my personal feelings about how politics are going in the United States. But I think here in this book, they're trying to challenge us to think about here's the way stories have been told. Like sure. they end chapter three with, let's bid farewell to the quote, childhood of man, <laughs> you know, and acknowledge that our early ancestors were not just our cognitive equals, but our intellectual peers. Yeah. And, and sure. they quote this woman, uh, Helena Valera, who said it of the Yano Mami, they're pe just people like us, equally perceptive yeah. and equally confused. Yeah. So I like that part of the book. Like, <laughs> can we just try and, you know, be a little more flat footed about stories about how everybody was primitive and now we're civilized? They're like, no, it's, it's just bullshit. So, <laughs> but, but, but it's basically baked into every, almost every story advertising i mean you know into many stories that are told or put in movies or yeah sure you yeah, know it's so i think for me part of the value of this book is that they keep poking at that and i think 
Mm. You know, yeah. I'm looking forward to reading some critiques that I can even feel some of them in myself, but I'm like, I'm still going to give them the benefit of the doubt to finish their argument here. So, well, the, the other <laughs> thing to bear in mind, there, there's a great, I, I'm a kind of expert on, on a field called management cybernetics. It was founded by a guy called Stafford Beer, Professor Stafford Beer, and I, I teach it and I mentor people using it. Um, and one of the one of the aphorisms that that is actually Stafford Beer's epitaph on his tombstone in Toronto is the purpose of a system is what he does. Yeah, and actually it sounds like a kind of meaningless slogan, but what he's really saying is that if you want to understand, it, like like if an academic writes a paper. They don't write that in a vacuum. They write that in the context of trying to get on in an academic career. Yeah. And obviously, in, in current modern academia, the only way you get on in, in, in academia is to get your paper published in a, in quotes, good journal. Yeah. And if you don't get your papers published in a good journal, you get fired or you don't get tenure or whatever. Right. So to a large extent, when you look at academics, they've always got a kind of ax to grind, which means that the arguments they come up with are quite often, frankly, ridiculous, but they are coming up with an argument because they know that someone in some journal somewhere will publish it and that would be good for their citation indices and all this kind of nonsense, yeah? So, you know, you, whenever I look at anything academics do, I'm always thinking of that as, okay, why did you write this? What were you trying to do? How did this further your career? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got tenure, maybe you're doing something a bit more honest because you can't get fired. I mean, Grable could not get tenure in the USA as a professor. He had to come to London because, because nobody will give him tenure. And that tells you something about the state of uh, US culture. It says it tells you a lot about that, um, and he, he, so he ended up a kind of refugee in, in, in Goldsmiths College in London because of that. Um, and yeah. these things are always going on. Whenever it's, I find it a useful discipline to to say I'm I'm reading the words, but what purpose is this fulfilling for the person putting these words down? What does it mean to them? Why are they saying this? Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, I think that's a fundamental for me. <clears throat> it's fun. I mean, it's a little bit fundamental. That's a systems theory kind of thing, right? It is. Yeah. It is <laughs> and it applies theory. to applies to software and other things. You yeah. Know, I can like I tend to joke with I'm mean, with Peter and some other folks. I was like, okay, I see how your program works and I see what it does, but I don't know what it's for. Yeah. And it's the same with a science sure. experiment. I can reproduce your experiment in lab, but I don't know what you, why it was performed. Well, it's worse than that these days. I've got, I've got a friend of mine is a very distinguished, <laughs> excuse me, biological scientist. Um, he's retired now, but he, he knows. I mean, when he started in biological science, it was a kind of Cinderella profession where barely any papers were published in it, right? It was all physics and, and chemistry. And, and now uh, over 90% of all scientific papers are published in, in biological sciences, in one form or another, pharmaceutical stuff, whatever. So it's gone bang and it's exploded. And there's an enormous amount of money riding on it, yeah? But in actual fact, there is a crisis of reproducibility where papers published in good journals around about 60% of them cannot be reproduced by anybody else at all. 60%? Yeah, so, yeah no, this really been bad. Some, well, there's been some work, and there's also been some work in computer science about people trying to reproduce results from computer science papers, yeah. as well as psychology papers. It seems to be everywhere. It's a big, it's yeah, a big well, issue. Yeah, well, yeah, so that just, I mean, that just is like, well, okay, so we gotta like do better. Yeah, but you I mean, also I was, look at what, what, what the drivers behind that are. 
is the insecure uh, status of post postdoc students. They're like kind of nomads trying to get a job here, trying to get a job there, traveling around the world. And if they don't do something that gets in a journal, they don't get their contract renewed for another year. So they have a strong incentive to cheat. But we're not, we're not allowed to mention that, of course. That would be embarrassing to actually admit that that's what's driving it. Well, so, yeah, I agree. But I would say when I was a graduate student, I was in the UK, 1971 to 72 in Surrey, University of Surrey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. In, the phys in the physics department, so no envy there, you know. We were in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my colleagues kept saying, well, you really got to write a paper, Bill. You really got to write a paper. And I was like, still working on some stuff. And I said, I don't really have anything to write about right now i'm still well, of course, back and, they said, no, and, and they actually said things like it really doesn't matter and i looked at them i said well i don't really have anything to write about right now <laughs> so I, in a way i knew so i was like doomed for that profession because yeah. i was like uh, i i'm actually really interested in what i'm trying to learn right now so I'll yeah, just... yeah 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 <laughs> it's got a lot worse since then because because of the computerization and everything and the Citation indices are automated and it's, it's much more of an arms race. Well, there's some pushback there. though, when a lot of younger people, mostly in the information science and library sciences field and even scientific, you know, the whole thing with Elsevier and stuff owning the scientific journals. There's been a lot of pushback from some younger scientists about, yeah, no, no we're not gonna, sorry. Well, we're I'm working gonna, with a lot of those guys. I mean, I mean, Pete, Pete knows David Bova, and David Bova's done phenomenal work in that space. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was on the CODATA, the International CODATA Committee for a while. And so we there was some work there on citations as well as, you know, preservation of scientific data. And I don't know if you know about CODATA. It's one of the, you know, integrated, the big international scientific uh, NGO devoted to data right hopefully kind of open data well they're working on it but you know it's yeah, a, yeah. it's got it's, it's got its own politics right it's a big it would have NGO, yeah. it's a big ngo and made up of people in scientific societies in different countries yeah, and, sure yeah but as i but say be, people are people and the drivers are, are not that different in, well in, the only every, thing I, every yeah I hear what you say, and I agree with you, but I'm not going to, but uh, I'm going to still think that we could create different drivers for ourselves. That is, we, well, could, drive ourselves, we could drive ourselves differently, well, of which course I also can. think I mean, is what, yeah. what this book is a little bit about. It's like trying to unpack, can mm -hmm. we stop talking about the, oh, there was this Garden of Eden. It's like, no, there was never a Garden of Eden. No, <laughs> never. Ridiculous. Absolutely. There wasn't, right? But that forces, right, a lot of I mean, they're trying, I think, outline for themselves. That forces a bunch of reverberations through how we think things are. Like this, you know, evolution from, you know, small little groups to bands to tribes and blah. And they're like, wait, what? <laughs> they're know? just making it up. Yeah, they're like, show us the, I don't see the evidence for that. No, there isn't. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate yeah. that. Because so do I. I think it did a great job. I like that. But say this particular chapter is really good on that. It's great. Yeah, and, I've, and it, for me, it helps us try. And we should when we use these words like "oh, bands and tribes and stuff." We should maybe think twice about what are we actually talking about here. Do we have yeah. some idea, <clears throat> or right, or are we just building on stories we've heard? Yeah. Well, of course, there are lots of funny stories about anthropologists. Um, going to places and being spun a yarn, like Mar Margaret Mead in, in, in um, Samoa, was it? Coming uh, of age in Samoa. I coming think, of age yeah. in Samoa. And it turns out they were just winding her up and, and, and they were just taking the piss and coming up with all sorts of nonsense that wasn't accurate at all. And she felt- well, that's, that what they they about, it, right? that's what they talk about, right? That's what they talk about in one of the other chapters about well, some people organize themselves so they could have have free time for gossiping, playing games, yeah, making cool. jokes, having a party, take a, going into visiting, rather than like you yeah, I'm, and, get and up also, and drive and plow the field. No, you no, I'm, no, I'm, no I got and a different also, plan. And also winding up the anthropologists. <laughs> well, they, I think it's easy to well, partially to get back to your, I think it's easy to start 
a kind of research project already wound to accept, you know, a spun yarn because you're not really, I mean, there's a famous psychiatrist that I read who once wrote a nice paper about what the, the job of a clinical psychologist was. And he says, you know, when you're seeing patients, the psychoanal psychoanalysis and stuff, he said, when you're, when you're, when the, you know, when the client, the patient comes through the door, if you think you know who that person is, you're, you're analyzing the wrong person. Because the person who came in this, and I have, I had a Zen teacher who said that is my hardest job in these interviews with students to not think I know who came in the door for a private interview. <laughs> Excuse me, I have to say, having been married to a very good psychotherapist for 45 years, I can assure you that she can sum somebody up with tremendous accuracy at the moment they walk through the door. <coughs> and then she has to sort of remember that and not lose it because she, because she can do it because she's seen so many people over the years. But if you, if, if you don't trust that capacity, you lose it and then you start making constructions that lead you up the garden path. But some people can do that. And I'm well, I think, well, it, so, yeah. well if, yeah, great. I mean, and I think this, I think well, yeah, Wilfred, Wilfred, scary. I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Wilfred Bean, the psych, psych, psychiatrist. Oh, yeah. But yeah, he yeah, also, yeah, and, yeah. and he was, but he was pointing out, in addition to you have to also be open to receive what you're going to receive without already having, you know, colored yeah. it, pictured it, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's just, and that's a tough, you know, when people talk about, you know, deep listening, it's not so easy. Well, it's not it's so easy, when you, especially when you consider that if you go to a Freudian analyst, you will definitely have Freudian dreams. If you go to a Jungian one, you will have Jungian dreams. They train you into uh, what their expectations are. Uh, well, and, you know, that, that's, that's how the thing works. Well, so they trained me as a chemist and what my expectations are when I walk in the laboratory. Yeah, but the human I mind. Mean, literally, a, I mean, literally. The human mind, I mean, yeah, but yeah, of course, of course, that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's what being trained to join a scientific peer group is all about. But it's a little bit strange when they're supposed to be, and they claim they were kind of scientific, that, that actually, of course, they weren't. You know, they were more like kind of literary figures. It's not really science, Jungian stuff. And well, it's interpretive. Stuff. It's interpretive. Yeah, in a but, way that's not like you know they're not using rulers. So no, yeah. But they're doing interpretation, which, in my life, has been valuable because I've yes, availed myself it's, it's of interesting services of people who have been able to really help me. You know, just help yeah. me as a human be a better yeah, person. No. Mm -hmm. And they didn't use rulers either. They ask me questions. <laughs> yeah. So. So I'm yeah, for I, this book about the being about the questions. Just keep poking at. <laughs> absolutely. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, one of the um. One of the interesting things I, I find really interesting is that if you look at being embedded in a particular way of thinking, like, you know, <coughs> so-called free market economics, which is not really free market economics at all, and striving to be competitive and more efficient, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's really a storytelling exercise, and you are being inducted into a kind of cult that every now and again runs out of road, like you kind of run out of road in 2008. And everything blew up, and, and they had trouble bailing it out. It looks like it's just about to blow up again. And they always rearrange the deck chairs and sort of claim that they could see it coming retrospectively, you know, but they clearly can't. They don't really know what the hell is going on. And they don't really have control of anything. 
Yeah, so, so I don't know what to make of that, whether I should just never read the economic section of the newspaper or just be a lot more open-minded about that there are people trying to help the rest of us figure out how to build a workable socio-economic political system of governance. Now you could say there's no hope for that. Okay, you and I are we'll disagree if that's but I think there's still I still, which may be naive, believe there is. But so I, I believe so do I. Ec economists so do I. are trying to provide I mean everybody who's has some does some analytical work is trying to provide some way of thinking about something that enables you know, a modicum of understanding, like here's a relation that seems to help me when I met, you know, do the next thing. You know, stepping off the roof without a ladder. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to do it. I saw what happened to my neighbor and I believe that would happen to me too. So I'm, you know, just give me the ladder and I'll climb down. <laughs> yeah. But I think, you know, there are people who are attempting. I don't think it's all just a waste of <laughs> time or right. what effort. i would say was i mean i i read the economist which is um the, the kind of british classical liberal journal and also bloomberg uh to get kind of what mm -hmm. what it looks like on your side of the atlantic and what it looks like on our side of the atlantic from a kind of mid a mid 19th century perspective which the economist is kind of wonderfully old-fashioned you know <laughs> in a kind of charming way but the set of assumptions is, I mean, in fact, I've started to make notes. Every time I read The Economist, I start making notes about the unspoken assumptions that they're operating on. And so I would appreciate it if you would share those. I would appreciate yeah, it if I mean, you would share it. Chris, it would help yeah. me because I haven't yeah. studied economics in no, no, it's a work in depth. progress, Bill, but I'd be very happy to share it when I feel that it's got enough in it to, to, to be worth sharing. Because there are lots and lots of unspoken assumptions that they just take as being obvious when, in fact, you look at it and go, hmm, why on earth would they believe that? Because there's no evidence for that at all. <laughs> well, it, it, they live in a very kind of linear world, you know, like um, uh, it's a world where if children sit in classrooms, it means they're learning. If they don't sit in the classrooms, they can't be learning. You know, it all seems terribly, terribly, terribly linear. And I think it didn't feel like that when I went to school. I mean, mostly it was just boring and they, they droned on you and you try to keep up so you could pass an exam. But it, it, what, it doesn't seem to correspond to their kind of belief about a linear input producing a linear output. I mean, I just don't think the world works like that. And that's one of their assumptions. Mm. See, so I don't read The Economist and I get different stories about how education works from interviews with like local teachers here in Austin, Texas. Yeah. So, sure. and I do remember my experiences in school being somewhat similar to what you said. Yeah. But not always, there were classes where there was some fun stuff going on. <laughs> yeah. You know, before, the, before, the, before the bell rang. And then it was like, I remember in high school, the, the boys locker room was not necessarily a safe place. <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, no rules. It was like, oh, let, yeah, me yeah. Get in and out of, let me get in and out of here as fast as possible. <laughs> it's just like big international uh, diplomacy, you know, that seems to operate in the same ethical system, you know. You know the United yeah, Nations so I, think they, so I think they start to point at this when they talked about, you know, the relationship in the next chapter where they really go into this question about why did we get stuck now they're making a, and you can maybe argue, well, you know, they're really putting together a straw argument here about being stuck. But I do think they have something to say when they talk about, you know, like the, the two different uh, clutches of people in the northern and southern part of the California coast, different parts of the fertile, so called fertile crescent, and how, you know, groups of people could be right next to each other, know about each other, interact with each other. Yeah. And it's still put together completely different, like socio political systems for governing yeah. each other, governing Absolutely. themselves. Yeah. You know, so 
you know, and I, so to me, the problem with things like The Economist and even Bloomberg is that they're all stuck on, they're already stuck in one model, yeah, one economic exactly. model. They are. Right? And That's this why is the I like Margaret Thatcher, right? Yeah. There, there is no what? alternative. <laughs> I think, yeah. there, no, there are alternatives. We're not looking at them. <clears throat> well, it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm interested in reinventing forms of money, because in modern society, money is the kind of exertion of social power that keeps things as, it is, as they are. The threat of taking it away and the offer of more of it is the most powerful kind of driver, which, of course, is, is a modern phenomenon. I mean, in the UK, virtually through the whole 18th century, there was no national money that you could just use in ordinary everyday life at all because the, the mint just screwed it up and didn't produce enough coins for people to use. So there were local currencies all over the country that were just kind of issued by uh, a local employer. He would pay in some kind of token that he manufactured, which was good for use in the shops in the area. Mm. And this kind of thing really didn't get established as a national currency that everybody could use on a sensible basis till about 1830. Took them a very, very long time to get to the point where everybody was using nationally issued coins and cash. You know, yeah, well, it wasn't United like States that. It wasn't. It. You you had it. You, you had the free banking before the Civil War. Yeah, uh, but we had our own. We had our money. own. But we had our own Mich Michigas before that. Yeah, with various states having different currency. I mean, it was like yeah. You might have learned something from the British. Wait a minute, before we go down this rat hole that we're partially dug, maybe we should like back out. <laughs> well, they had, a, they had a central bank and they abolished it around about that time, about 1830. They started to have a central bank and then they, they outvoted it and cancelled it and didn't get another one until 1913. Well, Federal Reserve. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Well, yeah. You know. This history, you know, pe people's arrangements for life have been much more diverse than. And they just kind of get written out the history. And people so that's what. Them. So that that's what I'm learning from this book is that they're pointing that out. So I haven't done yeah, anywhere absolutely. near the amount of history reading that you have. But but this book I just read by C. You know C. Y. Bailey about the basically 1780 to 1914. Also, from a global point of view, also educated me to the kind of diversity that was around before we you know established nation states and yeah. things like that and how those various entities were still able to interact with each other. Yeah. You know, share learning and knowledge. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only two nation states in the world as we understand them, really the French and the English who spent their time fighting each other. Um, and then it got spread starting with the Greek War of Independence in the 1820s, where the Greeks suddenly decided to become independent of the Ottoman Empire. So up to that time, practically everybody in the, in quotes, civilized world was living inside the borders of a kind of multicultural empire of some kind. They were not living yeah. in nation states at all. No, I know. And and unfortunately, I think you know, yeah. No, go but finish. the transition was very bad news. It was 100 years of complete nightmare and... and Ethnic cleansing and all sorts of terrible things. I mean, it, it, it's just appalling. It's not good news. The hundred yeah, years well. of kind of transitioning up to the 1920s is a kind of series of nightmares. It's just awful. Yeah, and I can, I, after reading Bailey's book, I, I think about, I mean, this book we're reading now is helping me, but I'm thinking about, and the time from the 1920s to the 2020s has just been we're just going to double down on this like neoliberal economic thing and see what happens. We're like, okay, so this is a freaking dead end. Like, <laughs> can we like that? That It's like you said the other day, like there is a door open because we're in yeah. a situation like, well, this is not going to work. Yeah. I mean, literally, right? People cannot yeah. live in 50 degrees centigrade. Sure. Human beings, sorry, we can't adapt fast enough. There's no way. So, you know, so something else has to happen. So I look at this as being, you know, open the way like that 
maybe the 1780s 18, to the 1820s or 30s were open where a lot of things were swirling around uh -huh. in terms of people interacting, talking about things, thinking about things. <coughs> yeah, so, doing things. Yeah. Right. You know, like things are happening now with, you know, right with currencies, but also as Pete introduced me to earlier a year ago, it's of these like decentralized autonomous kind of organizations about trying yeah, yeah. to figure out how one might make that work. I invested in the very first one in, when was it, March 2016, the, 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 the Dow, the very first one, it was supposed to be a decentralized investment fund, and it looked fine until it got hacked. And that well, caused all, all sorts of fur to fly. So I yeah, shared, I, 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 yeah. I shared with Peter thought I had on my walk last week is that we need a, I was just thinking, idly thinking, and the phrase came through my mouth, the Tao of poo. Then I decided we need a comedy channel because that would be like a skit. We should like. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to the, I'm not going to the Eeyore party, man. <laughs> what a downer. <laughs> Well, I've got a few crypt crypto investments, and I looked at one of them today and discovered it collapsed thirty percent in, in twenty four hours. Yeah, I I hey. have one. Yeah. I have one that was priced about eighty five dollars like yeah. five days ago, and now yeah. it's point zero zero nine. <laughs> yeah, mind you, the, See, this is worse than a thousand percent. I can't even figure it out. This is yeah, worse. It's, it's worse than the Schrodinger thing. It's like don't look in the box. Literally, yeah, do not absolutely. open the box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing about these things is they are kind of live philosophical experiments. They are, you know, the whole thing is a series of crazy philosophical experiments, some of which are going to work and some of which are complete disaster. You know? Well, the dawn of every, everything book, I think, is, is, I think, what you're alerting me to, it's got its own bias, as biased as it is. It still has given me an insight into a number of different experiments that have been tried, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, so you know, new ones. We could try other ones rather than, you know, yeah, the stupid great. burning, yeah. burning heap of glassware we're sitting in right now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, let's say I thought that chapter was. I, I forgot I read the book a long time ago I thought mm -hmm. I better reread chapter three today and I thought yeah this is really good this is just very nicely done um yeah it's very elegant it's witty and it covers a hell of a lot of ground across a vast expanse of time while also admitting that look guys we don't really know what the hell is going on but you know we've got the most ridiculously fragmentary bits and pieces uh, but what yeah, we can that, say is, is there were charismatic um, people who were inspiring something or the other, or often strange dwarfs and, and, and giants and cripples and all sorts of weird, you know. So obviously they were considered to be in some way numinous or in some relationship to some higher power. And, and who knows, maybe they were. <laughs> well, maybe they really were. Well, I, I mean, I just, this is what it is to be human. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't get away from it. It's like, stare, you can't, you know, look up at night and see all the stars and you have to go like, what, what is happening here? It's like, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And little kids are like that because you know they come in they don't know anything they're just pushing buttons oh look when i scream my mom goes nuts oh, maybe i'll try that again <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. well one of the things that makes me laugh having had brought up three kids you know they're all in their thirties now is that little kids just assume that you can go up to buttons and press them and something will happen and you go where the hell did they get that from that didn't even exist in the 19th century. I mean, you couldn't go up to things and press buttons and things happened. I mean, the light didn't come on. I mean, like, but they just kind of take into it like it's just normal. And you go, that's just weird. I mean, that is I very, don't know. very I, I, I just, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I just have to think that kids 
you know, before we had electricity, he pushed other things, knocked over the well, something in the in the fireplace. I mean, well, whatever. They, they, I mean, because they, they're kids. Be they'd have to they're be kids. very careful doing that because um, if they press the wrong thing, they're going to get their fingers burnt. You know. Yeah, well, I'm sure many people did. Well, of course they did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's how you learn. Not, I mean, I'm but, sure we all got our fingers burned at one point. So, like, yeah, so don't do that do again. Da- yeah, I've, so I used to do dangerous experiments with a with a screwdriver that could detect mains voltage, and I stuck it in a in a plug, and it went. Of course, it, you know, you I don't. Well, I'm not going to do that again. That, that was a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. So you have this thing, and I did my own, and then you wonder, God. It's a miracle. My kid is actually like, you know, 40 years old. How did, how did they actually, how did they get there? You know, because it's like, holy yeah. smokes, the stupid stuff I tried. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, and I've been reminiscing about back when I was younger. I mean, well, I grew up in New York City and, and you know, in, in Queens. So it's very residential, just home after home after home was apartment buildings. But I remember having a lot of freedom as a kid. And my mom just said, dinner's at five o'clock, be home. You know, either be there or be square. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I used to go into Manhattan when I was like 10 and 11. And I guess she just saw on a Saturday, we're going to the museum. She goes, you know, you know when to be home. And we take a bus and a subway and, you know, and wander around in Manhattan. It's like, that just doesn't mean people would be appalled. Like what? Your mother let yeah. you like, it, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, in my grandparents' era, they just used to go off and wander around the countryside because they were near enough to countryside on the southeast fringe of London to do that. But yeah, I mean, bunches of kids. I, I used to take a bunch of kids to go and spot the railway, the steam engines down at the flat, you know. At, 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 and watch the steam engines go by. I mean, we, we weren't just by writing stuff down, we just loved the steam engine. And there were kids there who were six, I was probably about 10. Everybody just assumed, well, you know, they'll come back, you know. We used to do stuff that all, like that all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's like, Phew. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where you learned all this stuff. That was the out of school learning. Like, well, yeah, I mean, you've heard yeah. this, but I mean, but the, the, the joke that kids, well, you know, if you've lived with dogs and done any training with dogs, a trainer that my wife and I have worked with for years, when she's teaching you how to train the dog, she says, your dog learns something about interacting with you every time. It learns something new. So when you want to teach your dog to respond to a cue, you have to remember every time your dog is learning something. Yep. And I think it's true for children because they are just mm-hmm. in this mode of like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, I can remember what that felt like, you know, I mean, I remember I probably about three years old when I noticed a kind of vapor trail in the sky. And I said to somebody, what is that? And they said, it's an aeroplane. I'm going looking at it going, doesn't look like an aeroplane. I thought aeroplanes were these kind of metal things with people climbing into and taking off from airports. That doesn't look like an aeroplane. Well, how can that be? It must be a different kind of aeroplane. Maybe that's a kind of angelic version of an aeroplane. It's not the same as... And it was ages, I puzzled over this like mad, until one day I noticed that at the front of the vapor trail, there was this little aeroplane. I went, ah, right. But I spent, I spent ages wondering about that, trying to work it out and not being able to understand it. Yeah. yeah. I remember my son asked me a question, but he was, well, somewhere between five and 10. He was, he, we're sitting at the table and he asked, he just goes, he says, so dad, where, where, where did the people live when they were dinosaurs? <laughs> so I just looked, so I just, I just looked at him and said, there weren't people on the earth when they were dinosaurs. He, he just looked at me and you could practically smell the wheels turning in his head going wait what (laughs) you know it's like wow (laughs) well my son when he was very little his mother said to him will you shut up i can't even hear myself think and he said yeah but thinking doesn't make a noise mum 
<laughs> to which she said, you know, <laughs> okay, you can go to your room now because that's <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about these cultures is that it does seem to me that there are degrees of freedom that it is like this sort of window opens up and there's a kind of degree of freedom for a certain period and then the culture gets kind of set in its ways and it goes like that and it carries on down a certain path before some kind of change of circumstances and it's suddenly got another moment i mean if you look at the history of stonehenge which is close to my heart because it's just down the road here you know what you find there is that, I mean, it's got this vast history that starts about 7,000, about, um, yeah, is it about 5,000 BC? And it goes through these cycles of sort of building and taking things down and building and taking things down. And then round about 1500 AD, they just give up on it. It's like, it's been this kind of huge cult center for thousands of years. And then suddenly everybody goes, nah. That's not interesting anymore. And they just, leave, they just leave it to the point where everybody just ignored it until 18th century antiquarians went along and went, what the hell is that? And the locals all knew it was there, but nobody else did. And then they started imagining it was built by Druids who were sort of knocking around when the Romans invaded and all sorts, you know. So, so there is this kind of um, strange kind of phenomenon where something can be very important and so suddenly, oh, it's not very important anymore. We're going to do something else now. And I don't know what drives that, but it's definitely, it was like that Kapetli Tepli um, temple building. Mm -hmm. They were busy building those temples and, and, and celebrating for a very long time. And then suddenly they just buried them and buggered off and did something completely different. Well, isn't that true? Again, like what, a, what, you know, what drives that is very, is very that mysterious. True? Isn't that true? Like, you know, the, the pyramids and the sphinxes and things like that also? I mean, yeah, you know, it is. That much yeah, yeah, more, yeah. Or the Gothic it. cathedrals in, in, in Europe, you know, suddenly this thing leaps into existence out of apparently nowhere and they build these extraordinary buildings and it kind of runs down and deteriorates to the point where it just becomes kind of imitative and it's not really got the spirit of the thing anymore at all yeah it does yeah it, no no that's it happens all the time when you think about um the building of the taj mahal you know that's an astonishing building that was built in the 17th century not a long time ago at all mm -hmm. people don't build anything like that anymore but they were still building stuff like that in the 17th century they seem to have stopped doing it in the 17th century but and i don't think anybody knows why not really. Mm. This is quite recent. Yeah, 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 sure. Do you have any answers? Oh, I think, I think, I think the, chapter, the chapter gives a great kind of series of, of examples of that phenomenon. I think it yes, does. It kind of, uh, that's one of the things I thought was nice about this chapter is it gives you a kind of illustration of the fact that people do extraordinary things and then suddenly they don't do them anymore something yes, happens and then they go off and do something else yeah and they they refer back to that in the subsequent chapters because yeah the stuff about you know the so-called well this is getting ahead but for me it was just a joke and they talk about the agricultural revolution they said we're talking about three thousand years so it wasn't really a revolution not really <laughs> <laughs> sure and of course, one, yeah. I think one thing they don't really talk about much is that pastoralism, like nomadic camel herding, uh, nomadic uh, herding, is the last development of, of ways of living. It's later than any of the other ones because you mm -hmm. can't do it until you've domesticated camels or whatever. So, so interestingly enough, you think about Arab tribes wandering around in the desert with their camels moving from, from oasis to oasis and all this kind of stuff. They're, I think they only domesticated the camel about, so about 1500 AD or maybe 1000 AD. So you can see that there was a certain communities of people who went, oh, we don't have to get stuck in this kind of, um, this one kind of civilizational thing. 
we can yeah. actually get out of it and we can take our camels. And obviously, if you do that, you also start to produce uh, trading routes. And that is, a, that is a late development. That is after the cities and the bureaucrats and all this kind of stuff. And it may well be that people thought, sod this, I'm fed up with all this bureaucratic crap and these two temples and these wars. They're just going to duck out, get a few camels and move on. Well, so I have two things. So I think you're right. That's what I like about this. So that also helps them put the lie to this like evolution from some weird state to this other more right. Like so they're yeah. like, just put put a stake in the heart of that thing and you know, leave it on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. But the it's other nonsense. thing I think when you talk like that, it makes me think that's what people are doing now. I think it we're is, gonna yeah. figure out we're gonna figure out how to govern ourselves without having a government. I'm like, okay, all right. I mean, you know, we're all just autonomous humans here. Well, so, you but, know, think, you know, think, I, I think, think about it, Bill, uh, from, the, from the kind of Persian empire that liberated the Jews of Babylon in 536 BC, if I remember rightly, there's this huge multicultural empire. And that was the kind of level of which government operated, as I say, right up until the 1820s, when, I mean, there were always the, the, the the English and the French fighting with each other. They were kind of like nation states, but they weren't anywhere else. And then suddenly they spread across the world as being the favored level of recursion. You organize and the power is at that level instead of this multicultural imperial level. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge transformation that, that, that it took about 100 years to happen. But there's no reason to think that that level of organization is in some mysterious way eternally favored as a level of organization. It's probably partly an artifact of building railways, for example, and, yeah, so and I publish, think... publishing newspapers that, that, that you can put on the trains and, and have a national newspaper, a sense of national identity. Well, we've got the internet, we've got, we've got all sorts of le levels of recursion are unfolding at lots of different levels. Do we even need to have a single level of recursion at which we think everything is organized? Maybe not. Well, I agree with you. I, that's the thing that I've been actually been noodling about myself with the growth of all these, like, let's try and be more decentralized, you know, and let's, you know, look at, I mean, because, you know, the state as an institution with this government, although it has some affordances that we depend on, you know, also looks like maybe it's got some affordances that is going to be quite, that may not be sustainable. So yeah, I, I think, think we're, right. we're up against trying to figure out <laughs> something else. And that, right. book by, that book by C.Y. Bailey about just that long 120 years from 1780 to 1914, basically, rip, you know, it's, uh, it just underscores your point there about what how things sort of spread in the way you just mentioned and i found that book to be really informative just on mm -hmm. that and also it's very much like you know it just well, i was talking with some friends and we were like trying to recollect you know so how long ago was it you know when did the ottoman empire end and somebody a friend of mine said yeah at the end of world war one so like exactly that's very, 1924 that's yeah, it's like not, not long ago at all. Back. No, I know. And the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the same time. You go, these, like, you know, these things have been there for a very long time. Suddenly, poof, they're gone. Yeah, so the thing, the thing, well, I get from your reading, really, the way you understand the history, but for me, it's like, and so, but we think of things like empire as being some like distant past. And it's no. not. No. <laughs> you know, because that's what, from 1924, that's, that's only two generations. Yeah. I mean, that's my parents, that's my parents' generation. So yeah. it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm once removed from that. That's, that's like yesterday. Well, I mean, my, <laughs> my grandparents' generation, they grew up in the 19th century. Uh, the germ theory of disease had not yet got properly established. So they had to learn Coughs and sneezes, spread diseases, and these little kind of slogans. Yeah, yeah. Don't spit, don't spit on the floor on the bus, and those kind of stuff. Because they didn't know that stuff. The, the germ theory right. was new. 
you know. Yeah, yeah. I know. They were they had gas lamps in their houses. They didn't have electric power. Uh, you know, when I was a kid in the 1950s, I visited some relatives that were back in the kind of slums of the old Kent Road, which we'd all got. My ancestors had got relocated from there in the 1920s. But there was this old aunt who still lived there in the old Kent Road, which is quite a rough area. And she did not have electric power in her house. She still had gas lamps because she never moved on to electric power. I mean, I can remember my grandmother saying things like, oh, look at all this terrible weather. You know what's causing that, don't you? It's all those rockets that keep firing up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I had a great grandmother who died at 96 or 97 when I was 11 years old, so 1956. So if you just yeah. go back from 1956 to 18, you know, 60, it's like, holy moly, the amount of change yeah. that woman lived through. Yeah. Yeah, it's massive. Yeah. I mean, we think we live through a lot of change, but I think most of it's quite superficial. It's kind of trivial stuff. Yeah, it's like a better wheel. We got a better yeah. wheel. Yeah, we need it. We need a better wheel. It's, but it's not kind of it's not kind of groundbreaking. I mean, obviously, the World Wide Web is a pretty significant piece of infrastructure. I think you know, it's definitely a, a serious thing. But what people do with it is mostly kind of trivial crap. You know, it's like why did why did you even bother? Well, that's almost, you can, well, I don't know. Let's not get into the mass culture thing. That'll just be really sad. Yeah, yeah. And we'll just have to play pop music or something so we can like get through it. So. Yeah, absolutely. I like, I like pop music sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, why not? So I, I find that uh, reading, I'm reading the book differently than I would have without the book club. And so one thing is, to this marching through chapters. I haven't been very disciplined at spending time just reading it. I probably should have, but but anyway, so that's I'm getting dragged through the chapters, which is an interesting thing. Um, the other thing is that I'm highlighting stuff, uh, you know, uh, on my Kindle, whatever, and then I can find those highlights pretty easily. So just just mechanically, so that I can discuss the text and so that I have like a kind of ready set of quotes to go. Um, that that's been something that I, I I started highlighting things today in the chapter and I'm like I wouldn't have highlighted this before for me but when I have a group of people I want to talk to about then I've got these highlights that are that are probably useful to me so I thought that was I'd like to see them because that's why I'm doing these underlinings that I've been trying to publish is for me it's like this is I want to this is worth underlying you know it's completely out of context it's just one sentence but it's like well, you know, you got to read the book. Sorry, I'm not gonna. I'm not building a critique here. I'm just saying this. This sentence struck me. <laughs> but I've gotten to with, the point. Um, I got to the point where I'm now. I'm going to be actually extracting sentences from footnotes because some of the footnotes are yeah. are like boom, pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I can read all of my highlights in one nice place on the Amazon website. And it looks like I'll have to sync that to Goodreads to share them with everybody. So I'll try that. Should put it into a markdown file and put it on the wiki. That's what, I, that's what Pete that would too. say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're totally right. I'll do that too. So how does this one compare with the Tuesday one, Pete. Were you on the Tuesday one? I was on the Tuesday one. Um, there were a few more people, uh, so we had a little bit more of a roundtable discussion. And um, let me uh, let me share my screen real quick and look at the notes. Um, let me try to find my web browser, if it's this one. 
so uh, one of the th we we spent more time talking about um, se seasonal and situational adap adaptation uh -huh. of leadership. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and kind of extended that to COVID times have been a a time when we could have perhaps. Um, changed our leadership style and didn't maybe and and probably are worse for it uh i think it was ken who talked about lack of a shared crisis means lack of a perceived shared crisis now that i think about it um means that we haven't really been you know we we don't maybe another way to think of it i um trevor you in this call early on you said something like a lot of people just don't think about it you know um so one of the things I've kind of observed about our, um, I like this one too, we're lo losing models of complexity mm. and building in a lack of circulation of ideas and things like that. Um, Klaus, uh, Klaus was there and uh, before we even started reading, he, he suggested, I think he was the one who suggested the idea of big questions, keeping track of big questions. Um, and one of them out of this call was, uh, Tuesday's call was, what does it mean to be a self-conscious political actor? But mm -hmm. the other idea that Klaus had is reading the book kind of with a critical eye through a particular lens. And this has ended up being his lens through it, um, you know, yeah. kind of anthropologically, who are we and what mm -hmm. does that mean? I saw, <laughs> excuse me. I thought it was a very interesting observation that all the philosophical works up to a certain point are dialogues. Yeah. That they mm. are conversations. Yeah. And the idea that, that they don't need to be conversations, they only take place inside one person's head is actually very, very odd. It's a very strange yeah. idea. Seems to have started with Descartes, as far as I can make out, René Descartes, with his um, dualism, sort of mind-body stuff. Mm. And it's, cra it's a crazy idea. He should have thought about 15 minutes and given it up, but he kind of, he kind of got, <laughs> no, the trouble, got a grip. The, yeah, the trouble is he thought about it for more than 15 minutes. And yeah, and then it spread like a sort of stupid virus, but it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the idea that you can explain human minds by what only what's inside this one physical body is ridiculous. I mean, like, didn't he notice he was speaking a language and sitting in a in a room and and he, he was actually a mercenary in the, in the 30 years wars a catholic roman catholic mercenary he was a soldier and the idea that you could explain everything by just looking inside his own head somebody should have come up to him given a punch in the fat mouth and say do you still believe that then so it's such a stupid idea it's like what get over it you know it's, there was it's, no one you see there was no one to give him the back of the head dope slap no, it's a shame. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, yeah. I mean, people are still trying to explain the human mind from just what's inside a, a single skull. And it's just like, it doesn't make any sense. Human beings by themselves are nothing. You know, it's a crazy idea. What, what are well, you doing? In the, I, you know? Well, yeah. Well, for me, though, the idea, I just much more. Now I'm confused now. I just, it was just more the, the idea that the thought is a, I, I was recollecting this with Pete the other day, but I had a Zen teacher once and she just said, what is the thought? Show me one. <laughs> she's like, yeah, you know, I want to see it. It's like, what? she's like, what? <laughs> You're like, all right. It was like, yeah, that, there's a question. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I think, oh, the other thing I thought is that partially because I've been doing a lot more reading in some of the psychodynamics and the object relations kind of psychoanalytical perspectives about how we often develop, you know, actually a good friend and I was just talking the other day about uh, the kinds of protective the ways we protect ourselves in order to get through childhood. You and I both had some, you know, how we grew up with our families or what that was like. And it was like, yeah. So partially I think why humans, why we glom onto some of these things is that we are trying to build 
some kind of a defense against what is, you know, I don't think the existentialists were wrong. It's pretty like, whoa, what is happening here? <laughs> and where did I come from? And what's going to, you know, what really is going on here? So I think part of it to be maybe more generous is that philosophy, you know, through the ages, people have been trying to come up with some stories about that, you know, that on a labor room to sit down, you know, literally have a beer and tell a joke and laugh at it rather than just cower in fear in the corner. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's for me, I mean, that is what we have to do because in the end, you know, as Jim Morrison from the door said, nobody here gets out alive. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose that, that thing about Cartesian dualism, the idea that the explanation is in here, which, which is still, you know, if you look at people, I've noticed that, that because people think that, that they're being more scientific if they talk about the brain, when they used to talk about the mind, yeah? because they think that it's scientific to attach something that can be kind of dissected and grabbed hold of to think that that's in some mysterious way more scientific. And of course it isn't. In fact, it's less scientific. So you get, you get people writing books about the science of storytelling and it's all about the brain. You go, no, 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 it's not about the brain. It's about the mind. What do you stop talking this garbage? And then they start talking about the brain and they assume that you can analyze it in terms of gigaflops or, 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 or it's a neural network with so many, so much RAM and all this kind of stuff. You go, well, no, it isn't. It's not a computer. It, it, it just isn't. Don't talk. This is just garbage. Just because you've invented the computer, it doesn't mean that the human brain is a computer. It clearly is not a computer. I'll have to find the reference and put it in, but there was a paper that I read a number of years ago, and I, I know I have it because I copied it, but it's written by somebody who basically their argument is, you know, the brain is not a computer and it does not process information. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've read, I've, I've come across that, I can't remember who wrote it, but that's right, it doesn't do any of those things. <laughs> now, because we have a convenient model of how, you know, we manipulate various pieces of what we call information or words or parse sentences or all that, that's like, I mean, I think uh, Noam Chomsky was asked about some computer vision thing and he said, well, I think that's just really, really, really useful. It can be really helpful, but you haven't, we haven't really learned anything about human vision. Yeah, building that's this. right. No. But we've built something really useful. So, well, I, well, again, a lot of this stuff is about getting, whipping up the excitement to get the next grant. I think a lot of AI stuff, it's like, it's like imagining that if you refine your rocket ships enough, and you can get them to Mars inexplicably. Suddenly, you'll 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 turn into um, uh, interstellar travel. You know, no, no. a rocket is not going to do interstellar travel. It doesn't matter how good it is. It doesn't do it. It's a completely different technology. And in the same oh, light, <laughs> point, machine learning has got nothing to do with human intelligence. And it is not going to suddenly go, oh, general intelligence. Blah, blah, you know, just because. Come on, why? That's just nonsense. Well, you know, you know, Joe Weizenbaum from MIT years ago said that he was really discouraged that people use the word artificial intelligence. He wanted people to say machine intelligence. Well, they do tend to talk about machine learning these days. Yeah, but he right. wanted them to say, look, this is because he was exactly like we are not, this is not to be confused with what we call human intelligence. No, I mean it's like it's like imagining that because you can type something into Google and you can get an answer. That, that means it's more powerful than any any human beings on the, on the planet and more intelligent you go well no it isn't it's just this is a search engine get over it you know <laughs> don't be ridiculous you know? it's actually more like get good at it it was the what you really have to do <laughs> but it's got nothing to do with human intelligence at all well yeah but again it's one of those kind of viruses that once it gets into people's minds they start thinking it's true 
so so they used to talk about the mind body problem now they talk about the brain body interface instead but it's still just as incoherent because of course a brain a brain is not like a kind of chip plugged into a a, a circuit board with a sort of clear boundary you know depending on what you're observing it for you could say that the brain is completely coterminous with the whole human body because there is not a point where you can go oh yeah i can see where the plug in the socket is there oh yeah right no 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 it isn't like that at all that is just nonsense well what i was really i discovered when i was much older that i had celiac which is this uh, inability to digest proteins from wheat and stuff and it mm -hmm. really affected my nutrition yeah badly i was on very malnourished and uh once i was discovered and got treated and stuff i told a friend of mine wow i can think better all of a sudden and i was just he was very kind he said well me he said well that's scary, Bill. But you know, but I was, it was very kind. But I was really like I hadn't noticed how much it impaired my ability to just think. Yeah, Pete's found some good references there in the chat. Well done. <laughs> yeah. So what else came up on Tuesday? about the i like the little things you showed about the book i think it's really those were really. yeah i <laughs> i like klaus's um, lens because that's for me yeah. also these this book is asking i'll have to i'm going to figure out how to way to say what mine is because i just find this book as being here's another challenge to what you always the way you always thought about things just yeah you know put that tickler in there and don't assume that's correct <laughs> So he he too. So on this call, um, Trevor especially talked about um, different cultures that had risen and fallen, and that that also was a thing that that Klaus came to. So he was talking about um, Cambodia and the Khmer uh, Empire and yeah. the richness of it, and now it's like yeah. you know it's gone. Conversely, he he was like so. Then there's the Japanese who have been living on that tiny little island for like a long time. And they haven't like, you know, burned out anything. They're still like hanging in there and, you know, uh, everything is going good. Um, he also mentioned China as going through a, some real periods of, of starvation and learning, adapting to eat anything, anything <laughs> the way he said it, anything that turns its back to the sun. Um, so, you know, rats or dogs or you know whatever that western people would go yeah i'm not going to eat that they you know they've got a yeah they do where... they do say we everything that's got legs except the table <laughs> that's a good saying too <laughs> i i haven't heard that one and i hadn't heard the back towards the sun but the, the ones that i know are um I, I my community is kind of vegetarian or vegan so um, we have, I won't eat anything that has a face or I won't eat anything that doesn't, that has a mother. Yeah. <coughs> we're, we're in a little bit, so the Tuesday call wasn't huge and this one's even smaller. Um, so I wonder if this is kind of a lull or a trend. <laughs> <laughs> It'll It'll be interesting to see uh, chapter four if people come back or if it's yeah, going yeah. off. Sure. I would prefer to have this time on my schedule. I don't, because I have something else Tuesday in the afternoon. I just, I don't really want to have that full a day. On Tuesday? But if it turns out that that's just, it's only going to be one group, I, I'll have to figure I, out what I, to no, do. No, I, I think but, we'll always, uh, I, I intend to continue the two, two, uh, two days every time thing. So I'll be here. <laughs> well, that'll be great. Yeah, that's that'd cool. Great. Cause, um, yeah. I'm oh, the other thing I want to throw, throw in from chapter two is that, you know, they went through, they had this great way of talking about uh, Claude Levy Strauss, both how, you know, how he was like completely blind and how he was kind of like completely on point. So it's really, that's kind of nice in a way, you know, to, be that kind of uh, generous with 
people's that's you know, kind researchers of another, in. That's kind of another not pompous thing that they do. They, you know, they'll talk about somebody from a couple different angles. They don't say, oh, you know, we got to venerate this this person because they were amazing. It's like, well, you know, these were times when he said something smart and these were times when he fell flat on his face. Yeah. Yep. So that's actually a nice model for how to like, can we deal with each other's, you know, work and writing and stuff. Yeah. Because that's what you'd like. And this really yeah. struck me as being like so on point, but over here I'm confused, right? Yeah. yeah so. So we call it? Call it, call it a wrap. Okay. Yeah, that was cool. Thanks, yeah, guys. It was very cool. Thank you, Thank Trevor. You. It's been great. I'll post notes and recordings. We'll Brilliant. see you around. See you, see you next week. Yeah, or uh, two, weeks, the, two weeks. Two weeks. It's two weeks. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Bye. Otherwise, see you see you around the internet. <laughs> yeah, quite yeah. possible. <laughs>